Um, good evening. <laughs> um, as a child, I think um, I was a fairly curious child, um, and I brought up. I was brought up in a household that was. Um, three other men in my family. Um, I was not brought up in a household where I had a mother. Um, so I was surrounded and bullied quite often by my uh, two brothers. Um, and so I, I learned one lesson, which was um, to survive um, in a sort of male-dominated environment, um, and, but survive in a, in a good way. Um, my curiosity brought me most of the time outside uh, I was not that one child that sat down reading books and being studious. I was really just outside um, and playing, uh, sometimes um, in longkangs, um, uh, because I wanted to be one of the boys, shooting catapults and all the rest of it. Um, and in a way to try and tame us uh, sort of wild children um, that we were, um, my father thought, well, we could actually uh, try to engage them in some knowledge. Um, and so he started buying these magazines every week, which were called Look and Learn. I don't know if you know them. It's probably before, beyond your time anyway. Um, but it's a kind of um, interesting children magazine in the sense that it, it was very visual. Um, and for me, that was the only way I could learn um, through being very visual. And it was, a, it was a magazine that talked about history and some bits of science and technology. Um, and I began to be very interested in science and technology, even as a female. Um, and I liked like, science fiction. In my attempt to um, give knowledge to my children, um, I started buying Legos and Kinects and thinking that, you know, my boy will probably learn how to make all these fantastic things um, and maybe he may become an architect. I don't think he knows and has any knowledge of it. He is in, the, in, in, in this hall today. But I, I ended up making all the things. I made the speedsters. <laughs> I made the aeroplanes. I actually thought they were fascinating. I would actually roll them and uh, make them speed all around, two racing along, and he would just watch. <laughs> and I even do this today with my nephew, and that's because I really love to assemble things. I like to put things together, um, and I like to create putting things together. Um, I see doing buildings like a jigsaw puzzle. Um, we have lots of ideas in our head. We really don't know what that vision is going to be or what that complete piece of uh, building or form is going to be. But we have all these ideas behind us. And it's really, really important because what you experience now sometimes comes out later. You know, it's a bit like uh, reading something. It really comes up later. And whether you're in any other um, artistic field, you shoot something, as the, the last photographer was talking about. You remember something from the past, and that sort of gives you insight to maybe what you do. So I design buildings, but I don't design buildings by myself, because big buildings takes a lot of people. My very first project when I first came back, about your age, was doing the Telecom Malaysia building. And it started with a sketch. Um, and it just started with an idea of having sky gardens on both sides. This was before the idea of green buildings um, and greening the universe. Um, this was an idea because I uh, wanted a high-rise building that would work quite differently. But we really still didn't have the form. We extruded the form vertically and it just became an elliptical building up in the sky. But we had this idea we wanted sky gardens on either side. And it was like a kit of parts, a bit like doing uh, the Lego or doing the connects. It's made out of components and parts that makes up a big building. But the idea behind these buildings are a lot more intricate than that. Um, and it's a fascinating process, this sense of assembly and making uh, to become something that you don't know at the end of the day until it's finished uh, in terms of design. And then it takes another seven years before we build it. Building big buildings take a long time. And, but the, the richness and the ideas behind this building 
um, when we were doing the form and it came up straight um, in, inside the studio, we spoke and said, well, it's not really very dynamic enough. There isn't really anything sort of, you know, um, catchy. There's, no, there's nothing moving in a sense of movement in this building. And so in one swift sketch, uh, this idea came from one of the guys in our team to actually just form the building and then you get this sort of dynamic building. So assembling ideas is really what I, I say when we do a building. Um, take this piece of origami. It's just a piece of folded paper. It may be any folded paper that you like, but that folded paper could become an idea for a roof, or it could become an idea for a facade of a building. Um, this facade took 14 drawings before we got to this solution. It's a very long process. Um, and when we design, sometimes we get inspiration from many different points of view. We could take a simple song kit, we can extract the diamond forms, we can make it digital because we're in a digital era, and then we can express it in our glass, and we can express it in our titanium, and then we can express it in the building. That simple one idea. Or we could take blocks of buildings, and this idea that we want to create a kind of hybrid building where we're moving towards densification and a building that basically will have place for people to live, place to people for work, would be combined into sort of like a jigsaw puzzle into a building that could turn into this. So the idea of assembly continues. Um, and sometimes it's really very frustrating because when we come to it, it's really like a blank piece of paper. It's a bit, a bit like getting a piece of ice. And you say, okay, you've got to do a piece of sculpture. What's it going to look like? I have no idea. Everybody thinks architects have all these visions and they come in their dreams. You know, <laughs> it's a fallacy. <laughs> I've got to tell you the most nerve wracking thing for me to do is to come to that empty piece of paper because I have no idea yet what it's going to be until we start working or until some ideas come in and then we w still won't know until we're finished. Take this building, which was designed even before Telecom Malaysia. The idea was harvesting daylight. Did anybody know that daylight is a renewable energy? Everybody just thinks solar panels on a roof um, to absorb the energy from the sun. And we in Malaysia live in a country of complete abundance. We have plenty of water. We have plenty of daylight. We have plenty of greenery. But we're really squandering all that we have. We really have a jewel of a country to live in. And in years to come, it'll be the envy of other people because of all the abundance of natural things that we have. So the idea of harvesting daylight became something, I have an obsession a little bit, I've got to say, about daylight. Became this building which had a double skin and was innovative, the point of this idea of science and technology. Because if there was nothing to move us in terms of an idea, it would never take me, it would never take me through the whole process of building a building which sometimes takes between five and seven years. That first idea of assembling and seeing the idea finish can only take me through if that idea is really good enough. Take this piece which was a diamond, it has a facet and became later something called the Shell Tower. This multi-faceting building also um, uh, taking daylight into the building, as you can see here. Or take this idea, a drop of water from the sky, celebrating our abundance of water. By the way, Malaysians are one of the biggest users of water in the world wasters of water in the world, <laughs> according to the UN, by the way. <laughs> and we created this building that had 360 degrees because it was a showroom. You know how all sites for new developments have this show gallery, right? But we wanted this show gallery to tell a story, and this story is about collecting water, a natural resource. And so it became something more interesting than just the gallery. 
or take this idea, which was basically a sketch of an idea, the importance of the eye and the, and the hand to actually draw, I can't say more. We can live in a digital era where everybody really believes that the computer is the answer and we can do all the parametric designs that we possibly think, but really it comes down to the hand and the eye. And what we created was lifting off the ground and then tucking buildings underneath and then it has all the components of design for sustainability. In fact, most of the buildings that I've just shown you are designed for sustainability, but that's not my main story. My main story is about assembling of ideas into a building. Everybody should be going green at this point. And then coming up with a university, which is now on the brochures of Harry Watt, who comes from from overseas and not, is not a Malaysian university, but they're very proud and use that as a symbol for that university. By the way, it's very scary to walk at the top of this building. <laughs> I got to the top of the building and I didn't even go to the edge and I told the client, you go, I'm waiting here. <laughs> so I'm coming from a very big project to probably one of our smallest projects and the reason why I'm coming to this very small project is because I see this really as a vision, uh, an idea of how we should build in the future. Expos happen every five years. And the biggest thing about expo designs is there's a lot of wastage. People actually build all these pavilions from their country, like peacocks, showcasing their buildings. And when the show is over, those pavilions remain and they become waste. If the country has enough money, they actually take those pavilions back home. But more and more cases, they can't because it's too expensive because it actually it's held in Shanghai or it's held in Milan. So we wanted to approach the expo in quite a different way. Expos are about the vision of tomorrow and that's what our subject is today, right? The vision of tomorrow. I can't tell you what the vision is tomorrow because I'm so busy trying to think of how we're going to solve the problems of today that we have created probably 100 years ago. This is the World Fair, year 1935, just before the World War. And it talked about big epochs and big projects and big buildings and the salvation of, of the human, humans are through science and technology. And whilst I celebrate science and technology, and it's one of my favorite things, I'm looking now for science and technologies for solutions that we to to for solutions that we have created years ago. You can see that that sort of look at the scale of it. Look at the epoch idea, and this is over a hundred years ago. Incredible! You never see this anymore. So when we approach the Malaysian Pavilion, we didn't want to do a Malay Milan Kaabao building or a traditional Malay building. That's been happening for all the pavilions that we've actually been showing. So we wanted Malaysia to be proud of something about sustainability and our rich resources in our country. This building actually is in my father's house. It's 100 years old. It's made out of timber. It was dissembled and assembled. It was, it was originally built in Ipoh and it was transported because they salvaged it, brought it back home and rebuilt this house. And what I wanted to take away was the ingenuity of that construction. The idea that we could build something and then we can dissemble it and move it somewhere else. The idea that we're using timber engineering or resourceful timber, this is timber that is from resource um, sustainable timber forest timbers um, and then we could create the construction of this building. And so we came to the idea of the pavilion being seeds from the forest. We wanted to celebrate the idea that our future really comes from our forest. It was more message to Malaysians than it was a message to the world. And so from this simple sketch we come to the idea that these buildings could communicate an idea, 
and the form that it would take, and that we could assemble it, we could manufacture it here, we could get it onto a boat, we can construct it over there, and once the show is all over, we can actually take it down and bring it home. Or at worst, it can disintegrate into the ground. And so the, for me, the future really is building resourcefully from what is called a concept of cradle to cradle. That means you actually take the timber, you build it, or from materials that you can reuse again. And once you've finished with it, and once the building has died, you, it either goes down, into, disintegrates into the ground, or the metal bits can be um, melted again and you can reuse it. So this idea of completing the loop, that was the message of the building. It came with 50,000 parts, nuts and bolts. It was 200 metric tons. It was all measured. Unfortunately, this building is not brought back to Malaysia because it's one of the cheapest pavilions built and it's just too expensive to bring back sadly to say, but anyway, it will disintegrate into ground because it's actually made out of timber. So this image um, of something traditional interpreted into something contemporary, actually when I took this image out and when you asked me to make this talk, it was a great, um, it was a great revelation to me because at the years in my university, I wrote um, an essay about traditional moving of houses in the Trojan, uh, in Troja, in Indonesia. And subliminally, what I've done in the past has influenced me in what I'm doing now. Thank you very much.